The Chi Ranger Podcast starts now. Greetings and salutations, my excellent friends. I hope you're having a fantastic day. My name is Steve Miller, the Internet's Chi Ranger, and this is the Chi Ranger Podcast. Now, I would like to thank you for joining me this week on YouTube or downloading the MP3 from iTunes or ChiRanger.com. Now, before we jump into the show, I do have a little bit of an announcement. First of all, it is great to be back. I am jazzed about putting together this week's show. So, a few things. Number one, for, well, this entire season and for last season as well, I always had a segment called Question of the Week. And that was a way for us to interact and for you to ask me questions about life in Korea, travel, etc. And since I've started doing the daily vlogs over on the vlog channel, I've actually had the opportunity to answer and respond to more questions. And since I am doing that, I don't necessarily think that the podcast is the best place for uh, a response to questions. Now, that's not to say that if a great question comes in, I won't include it in the podcast or create a standalone video on the main Chi Ranger channel. But I really think that for discussion purposes, going over to the vlog channel is probably the best way to handle questions that do come in. Also, I have to say that since YouTube has gone over to the Google Plus inter uh, integration, the discussions have just gone through the roof on the number of different videos and different topics because of the way that comments are threaded not only through the YouTube interface but also through the circles on Google Plus. And I'm really enjoying that kind of interaction with different people. Now as we round out this year I will be making some changes to the podcast so when I do come back in 2014 I will have a more streamlined podcast that will have a lot of the same elements but also a few different segments. So if you have anything that you would like to see in the podcast in the 2014 season please let me know in the comment section or shoot me a message I would love to hear from you. Now, all that being said, it's time to get started with the news. Welcome back to the podcast, everyone. And as we do every week, we kick things off with stories from the Koreas. Now, this is a very interesting story out of North Korea surrounding the execution of 80 individuals. Now, according to various news reports, North Korea executed some 80 individuals in a massive display before thousands. Now, what exactly was their crime? Well, watching a smuggled South Korean television program critical of Kim Jong-un. Now, of course, there are no first-hand accounts of what actually happened, leading many to speculate that maybe this was a fabricated story. But at least one North Korean defector heard about the incident that allegedly took place on November 3rd. Now, the individuals were said to have been taken to a big stadium, tied to stakes, and then shot. Now, there is lots of strange news coming out of North Korea. And that's not to say that this story isn't true, but you always have to take these things with a grain of salt. So, being in North Korea, and watching contraband is a huge risk. And making a show of things is certainly within the realm of possibility. But whether or not this actually took place, when you have pretty much one person saying that he heard it from other people in North Korea, I'm not saying it's not true, but I'm saying that is a lot to take into consideration with other, without any kind of other verification. So uh, I'm not completely sold this is true. I mean, imagine taking 80 people to a stadium of 10, 20, 30,000 people, tying them to stakes and executing them. You, you think that if that would really be true, that there'd be more unrest, more discussions, more things happening. Um, but who knows? Kim Jong-un is trying to stay into power, trying to reel things in, which kind of brings me to a second story, whether or not Kim Jong-un is actually in control. Now, this story is one that just doesn't seem to be dying. Now, in March, there was a report, again, one news organization carried it, uh, that there was an attempt on Kim Jong-un. Now, 
again, this story has resurfaced and it's leading some to suspect, okay, so this is the second time the story has come out. Is Kim Jong-un really in control? Is there a split between the ruling majority and the military? And honestly, I, I don't know. It's, it's not conceivable that there could be a split given Kim's upbringing and his lack of experience. But to have repeated stories of coup attempts or assassination attempts just seems like a lot of wishful thinking. And I don't really see that coming into play. I just, I just don't, honestly, I, I just don't see that. Because if there was a coup attempt, if there was an assassination attempt, that would radically change things and destabilize things in the area to, to a whole nother degree. And then, at least with Kim and the Kim family, you kind of know what you're dealing with with North Korea. You you kind of know what to expect. I mean, Kim Jong-un is a little bit of a wild card, doesn't really play things like his father does. But if you were to have just a military rule, someone jump in there and take over things, that would be a whole nother mess. And that's one I would not want to see. Now, finally, from the Koreas is a story that has come out this past week that I think warrants a lot of discussion. So if you have an opinion, please leave it in the comments because this is something that I would love to talk about more at length with. Now, uh, South Korea did meet with Japan finally on a foreign minister level, but is still not happy. Now, Vice Defense Minister Baek Sung-ju and his Japanese counterpart uh, Masanori Nishi met in Seoul to discuss all things North Korea. Now, while they agreed that some things must be done to contain the DPRK, and they vowed to work together, South Korea continued to take a stab at Japan by saying, quote, Japan should first reflect on history and push the move in a way to dispel speculation and concerns of neighboring nations. Now, Again, making statements like this plays out incredibly well to the domestic Korean audience. In fact, they've just recently published a new list of people who were killed uh, in Japanese forced labor camps and more comfort women and have repeatedly made uh, calls for Japan to reflect on its pass and acknowledge the history of the situation. And Park Geun-hye continues to snide Prime Minister Shinzo Abe by not having a state-level meeting despite Japan being open to the request. She has put out that Japan must first acknowledge history, the correct view of history, before she's willing to meet with them. And this is really not doing anything to move the relationship forward. Uh, Park and Hayes also come out and said that, hey, we should have a joint history book. We should have inclusions of Japanese accounts of the events, Korean accounts of the events, and Chinese accounts of the events. Korea and China are now moving closer to dealing with things in a regional manner, which in terms of aggression is great. In terms of isolating Japan, not so great. Uh, in in addition, one editorial came out this past week, and the link, of course, is in the show notes, uh, in The Chosen Ilbo, where the author, uh, a staff writer, really took the Korean government to task, basically saying, are we Koreans being, you know, too petty? Are, are, are we being uh, too... Uh, I don't know, see, resilient, uh, immovable in our stance with Japan. If you look at the rest of the world, they have forgiven Japan, they have moved past the issues of Second World War, and are now working with Japan. If you look at Korea, they continue to say, well, you know, you're going back to your right-wing ways, you're trying to be militaristic again, we oppose the self-collective uh, agreement, and it really is is calling in the task, are we really focused on the past and ignoring the opportunity to move into the future? And I think that's a great question to ask. Personally, I think a lot of the concerns that the South Korean government has regarding the historical views of what Japan did during the Second War, World War are valid. However, I also believe that trying to force another nation to accept 
a certain point of view that they necessarily don't want to reflect on or view, and making that the basis that you have continued relations with them is a bad move. Like I've said previously before, state your case and drop it and move forward. If Japan doesn't want to acknowledge what you have to say, then that's Japan's thing. You can't force someone else to accept your point of view. You, you can't. You can make the case, but if you continue to try and try and try and try and try to promote the same point of view and they don't want to listen, people just ignore you. And that's what's happening. So that's all the news from the Koreas. Moving on to some East Asian news, I'd like to talk a little bit about Super Typhoon Yolanda, or Haiyan as it's called pretty much around the world. Now this is the typhoon that devastated the Philippines. And I have to say that when I saw the pictures coming out of there, it was shocking. Now I love the Philippines, my wife is Filipina. I go to the Philippines quite often, I go to not necessarily that region, but I do go to Boracay in a uh, fairly um, regular basis because I just love the area. And a lot of people were shocked at the amount of destruction. And I, given how coastal that area is, given the way that it's a very much developing area and you don't have a lot of you know, strong buildings to you know, withstand that kind of devastation is certainly warranted. Now, you also have to take into consideration that this typhoon was stronger than Hurricane Katrina. And you saw the devastation that Katrina caused the United States and how poorly the United States responded to that situation to really criticize the Philippine government for responding in their manner to a more devastating event with fewer resources I think is unfair and I really have a lot of respect for what the Philippine government is trying to accomplish and really want to salute everyone who's come forward to give aid to the Philippines. It's, it's awesome and I certainly wish everyone a speedy recovery and my heart goes out to all those who lost people in there. I'm very thankful that the death toll wasn't the 10,000 or more that was originally projected. That would have been just in Incredible. It just would have been horrific to see that kind of destruction. Uh, some other stories. Now, China did sail into Japanese waters recently. Now, this is something that, again, is very worrisome to me. Uh, four Chinese Coast Guard vessels entered Japanese waters near the disputed islands. And while this incursion wasn't met with a response that we have seen in the past with Japan, uh, having their own vessels go into the area or launching fighter jets. Uh, this lack of a stricter response by Japan may embolden the Japanese, uh, the Chinese to do so again. And that's exactly what I don't want to see. I don't want to see Japanese and Chinese fleets getting very, very close in these disputed areas while both governments are, you know, being fairly respectful and not issuing... Uh, commands to open fire one another, you never know. You, you get these tense situations and not being in the thick of things, you never know what may or may not happen. So uh, something again to watch on a very, very close basis. And finally in the news, a very interesting article that came out. Uh, is Japan racist? And this is, I thought, was a very good read from a longtime foreigner uh, about their experiences in Japan. And many of the situations in the article are echoed here. And anyone who is looking to move to either Japan or Korea, for that matter, should actually read this article. It just talks about a lot of the things that you experience being a long-term resident and whether or not it's really a, a racist thing or whether or not it's just you not really adapting to life in a foreign country. So, and especially a, a foreign country that doesn't have a large foreign population. So I think a lot of times that Americans, Canadians, people from more Western countries who have a very uh, diverse population sometimes struggle with living living in a very homogeneous society just because we expect things as they are sometimes 
in our home countries rather than things as they would be in a very homogeneous society. And that sometimes just isn't the case. So uh, with this story and all the stories, if you head on over to ChiRanger.com by clicking the show note icon, uh, you can take a look at the article in depth. And please let me know your comments in the section below. Traveling abroad doesn't have to be just about visiting exotic locations. It can be with a purpose. And this week on Chi Ranger RTW Travel Talk Around the World, we're going to talk about just that. Just take me away. Welcome back to the podcast, everyone. Hope you're having a fantastic day. This week on Travel Talk Around the World, I am joined by Shannon O'Donnell. Shannon, welcome to the podcast. Ah, thanks so much. It's great to be on here. So we're talking about traveling abroad with a purpose. And why don't we start things off by introducing you to the viewers. Please tell us a little bit about who you are and what your area of expertise is. Absolutely. So five years ago, I left to travel around the world. Sort of one of those one year, find myself. Uh, sort of trips. And mm -hmm. I told myself I was going to volunteer on the road. And so that one year turned into five. And the service aspect of my travels actually sort of evolved into taking on a much larger aspect of what I wanted to do as I was on the road and actually the message I wanted to share with people. So I documented the initial travels on a littleadrift.com. Mm -hmm. And then in 2011, I launched my passion project, which is grassrootsvolunteering.org. And it's a website that connects travelers with local causes and communities and social enterprises and just everything from long-term volunteering to cafes that are making a difference in their local communities. And so it's a, a database, a way for you to connect in whatever way you feel comfortable with the places you're visiting. Oh, that's really cool because one of the things, as, as I work a lot in the travel industry, is I hear about people traveling and wanting to do some good while they're exploring the world and you know volunteering is is a way to do that so that is you just an amazing amazing story so you know tell us a little bit about more about the options that are out there in terms of how things vary in terms of short-term versus long-term opportunities so one of the most common questions i get is, is you know how do i've always wanted to volunteer it sounds like a great notion but it costs thousands of dollars. Thousands of dollars. Once I do a Google search, there's just all these these organizations. What do I do? And that's a really difficult question to answer because there's no one like here's the company you should go with. This is where you should be volunteering. All the interests and every organization and the place you want to travel all factors into it. Mm -hmm. So I also like to tell people that volunteering might actually not be the best solution if you only have a few days or a week or two in a place. It might be much better for you to go and enjoy aspects of your vacation, but then support social enterprises or businesses that are really invested in the community long term that need your tourism dollars to support a cafe that maybe trains, you know, moms, single mothers who, who you know, want to put their children through school. And so this cafe gives them skills, employment, and you're there, you get food, you get to learn more about their mission and feel like you're doing good, but it's not actually a long-term time investment since you're not in the community very long. And then there is everything to six months and three months volunteer trips where you can do conservation volunteering and and teaching and all sorts of anything that you're interested in. You can volunteer your skills or things that you've learned in your profession on the road somewhere. So, so if we're taking a look at like the minimum window of volunteering, what 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 is the the minimum amount of time someone should be willing to say, okay, if, if I don't have this time to travel and volunteer, I should look at contributing to local businesses versus signing up for a volunteer project. That's a great question. And generally, I would suggest if you, if your goal is to work with children, mm -hmm. that you look toward three months and up projects. Okay. So one of the things about my databases is you can't search for volunteer opportunities with children that are less than a month because you really want 
Well, you want people who are going to be there and be invested and not cycling through the children's lives. But something like conservation programs, some of them might have week-long programs that are perfect. They have a system in place to train you without taking away from the project. And so it comes down to research and asking the right questions and then judging your own ethics about, is this a positive way to contribute? Is it constructively working with the local community and adding resources and and expertise okay so that actually sounds really you know level-headed and whatnot and you have the database there where you can like search and everything in terms in terms of i i guess a, a profile of what you know mentally say i'm thinking about like volunteering abroad what kind of characteristics you know make for a good person to do that flexibility, <laughs> flexibility. and Yes, and low expectations. <laughs> why, okay, so why, why, why do you say low expectations? Because if you go with an idea of what it's going to be like, I can guarantee you that you will be disappointed. Developing countries are, you know, bureaucratic, they're messy, things don't flow on time, and some of the things that are really regimented or second nature to a business in the United States would not even, like, it doesn't even factor into the place you might be visiting. And so you don't realize some of the social constructs and the, the way that you view what things should be like until you actually go travel. So if you, if you have this idea and you've constructed you're going to do exactly this and you're going to have this huge impact on this community and you show up and it's different or they say, you know, you are going to go out in the field, but what we really need, because your English is perfect, is for you to make our website better. Well, that's not sexy, and it's not awesome, but it is really useful. Mm -hmm. okay. And so when you lower your expectations and you and you sort of lead with the idea that you're going to serve in whatever way you can be useful, you get a lot more satisfaction because you leave feeling useful. Okay, okay, that that totally totally understandable as well and and great advice to have now you you mentioned that you originally set out on a one-year trip and it, it morphed into a, a much larger project what are what are some of your favorite experiences during your time abroad when you were volunteering well my first one and it didn't go well on the on the organizational side or the company I used, I had some issues with, but it was at a monastery in Nepal. Ooh. And I worked for a month with some young monks. So I had from five to 18, and I was teaching the younger monks English. And it was, it was amazing. It was really educational. It was humbling, um, very difficult. Some of the younger monks were very naughty because I had very little language skills to say, hey, let's not throw paper wads at each other. <laughs> You know, but that was one of my favorites. I also volunteered with my niece. I took her to Asia with me, and we tutored for about five months a, a Burmese woman. And mm -hmm. so my niece and I, she was 12 at the time, together came up with lesson plans and charades and different games to be able to teach English to a Burmese woman. Oh, that's, no, that's awesome. Uh, any, any bad experiences over the time? That's a tricky question. So... My experience with a specific organization, because I went in with expectations, mm. left me really disappointed and it created some frustrating situations the first time that I used a company. Now I volunteer independently and I use the internet and my database and, and other travelers to find independent sort of grassroots businesses, small businesses that I can work with for free as long as I find my own accommodation and food and that sort of thing. And those have been the most rewarding. I had one in... Mexico, where I found a community center that needed somebody, and, and it's those sorts of connections that I find most rewarding because I'm able to find an experience that really fits me on the ground. Okay. Now, in terms of from the company side, from the organizations that are looking to have folks come in and volunteer, do what are some of the concerns that they have? Uh, some travelers don't go with, well, the accurate expectations, right? And so mm -hmm. there are demands, there are expectations that things are going to be different. And then the, the company's going to change the experience to suit what you would rather it be. And so some of the, the number one sort of dissatisfactions and issues come when 
you're not flexible on the ground with the local partners, with the language differences, with everything that you know we know to be true about travel. It's going to be doubly true when you're there working really closely with a local community. Okay, yeah, I, I can certainly understand that as well. Um, any any tips besides being flexible and going in with low expectations that you would like to to offer people who are thinking about doing a, a volunteer? I, I mean, I, I guess one of the things is is, is that do you like have a, a mental checklist that you got kind of go through that when you look for a volunteer opportunity that will help you narrow down your search of what kind of organizations and what kind of environments that would be better suited to a, like a, whatever personality type someone has. Absolutely. So first is to look to your own skills. What are you interested in? You know, if you don't work with children and never have in the U.S. or wherever you're living, then you might not want to jump in in another country with children who don't speak your language or have different cultural situations. Like it might not be the best, but if you have an interest in construction or you you know, we're in business or law or any of these things that you have an expertise in, your first place to look is within that skill set that you already have. So now you've sort of narrowed down what you might want to do. And once you find organizations, the checklist sort of goes, where's their money going? How long are they invested in the local community? Is it a co-investment? Do the local people want the project that you're working on? Mm. And if no volunteers show up, is there still sort of a contingency plan? It's still going to happen. There's still something. So it's not completely reliant and dependent on, on volunteers. international. Exactly. Volunteers. So, and then is it, is it ethical? Do your research. It's really all on you to do your research. No one else is going to do it. And there are some ethical concerns with the dependency and the dignity, you know, mm -hmm. when you're going abroad. So, that's my mental checklist is the money, the co-investment of the community, and the ethics of the actual project itself. Oh, okay. Now, can some of these outside links that people need to follow up on, are, are, are they provided in your database when you come up with, the, when you do the search? Absolutely. So the database will lead you to lightly vetted. Like, these are organizations that have come across my path. I've gone onto their site. I've often emailed and asked sort of about their financial structure. I have lightly vetted the organizations that are in the database. It's still on you to then follow up and ask a lot of questions. And in terms of how to ask the questions, actually, I wrote a book called The Volunteer Traveler's Handbook. And it goes into the, the mind frame of volunteering and the ethics behind it and how you can really understand the mechanisms of the development and aid industry and the role that volunteers play within that. Uh, super. And where can people find find the book? It's available in e-versions and print on Amazon and Barnes and Noble, IndieBound, Kobo, all those different mediums. Oh, cool! Very cool. Well, Shannon, thank you so much for joining us this week on the podcast. Where can the folks find you on the interwebs? Oh, on the interwebs, I am Shannon um, RTW at Shannon RTW on Twitter. A little adrift com is my travel blog and photography and the grassroots volunteering has those social enterprises and volunteering opportunities databases that we've been talking about cool thank you very much and folks if you head on over to chiranger.com all those links will be over in the show notes so you can just click on that and go right to her sites shannon thanks so much for joining us this week I really appreciate you having me on and so that I could tell people a little bit more about volunteering. That's been awesome. All right, folks, I'll be back in just a second. just about do it for this week's podcast i want to thank you once more for joining me this week now you can keep up with all my adventures with all my social media links you can find that in the description box or over in the show notes at chiranger.com if you have any feedback about the podcast please shoot me a message you can do so at podcast at chiranger.com so until next week remember to be true to yourself and always be awesome <music>